This is John Cola with OKRod.com. Today with another exciting episode for you. And I'm here in beautiful Puerto Rico, overlooking our properties in the background. Literally, we are in the jungle, in the forest, nature behind us. This is a wonderful place where Kailash and I decided to purchase property. Of course, he lives here year round and I'm currently developing my three acres into a permaculture style farm, which we will both be having adjoining properties with a retreat center is the goal one day. Anyways, in this episode, I want to introduce you guys more to Kailash because many people may not know who this man is. I've had on my channel for, what, the past 15 years he's appeared at various points. Some of his old videos when he actually did look like a kid. I mean, he still looks young now, but he, he literally was a lot younger then. Uh, links down below to the videos I've made in the past with Kailash, but I've never really introduced who he is or his story. I mean, I personally known him for like 24 years, but I know a lot of you guys haven't, so I really wanted to introduce him to you so you could really get to know this man who has literally been a vegetarian since birth, right? No meat for this man, and look, he hasn't withered away yet. <laughs> so, so we're gonna get to know him more, but more importantly, we're also gonna get to learn about his new online venture. He just recently started the Vital Influence Portal. And we'll also be showing you guys more about his Vital Influencer Portal and how you can get a special breathing exercise not available anywhere else to connect your mind, body, and spirit and everything. And he'll tell you more about that in a minute. So Kalash, you wanna welcome, say hi to my audience and, and just share some general information about you? Hello, it's so nice to be here. Thanks, John, for having me again, <laughs> one of your clips. And nature, is, it feels so amazing just to be sitting out here. So as you said, I was um, a vegetarian my whole life. I'll tell you a little bit about my parents if you'd like to. Yeah, hear. sure. Yeah, I know That's important too. So my, my mother actually worked in the very first health food store in Berlin, Germany, the capital of Germany. And my dad, he traveled to India where he ate fruit. You may not have heard the story, John. I don't think I did. So he ate only fruit and he was fasting also in India. For he, how long? He was not on a spiritual path. At he was the a time. fruitarian for how long? Well, in not a long time while he was in India. It's how long like was that? A, a few weeks. Oh, he I was see. there for a month, I see. several months, but he, the fasting was on fruit. He called it like a fruit fast and also he did some water fasting. Um, I don't know exactly for how many days he didn't disclose that, but he had an amazing experience, like an awakening experience, we would call it, like a spiritual experience where just everything felt amazing, everything like, he felt love, you know, for several weeks. He now, is that like, just because of the fruit or because also he was going and visiting yogis and other things, meditation? I mean, I don't know. So he was not, at that point, he did not meditate yet, but he was in India and I've been to India, the, the, the vibration, you know, it's like, it's a very spiritual place. It's the birthplace of yoga and other spiritual traditions. So he, he was su surrounded by spiritual people and he was eating only fruits for a certain period of time. And the combination, he thinks, it was the combination of things mm. that helped him go into this, like a tr trance, you know, like a being awake, not like hypnosis, but like, like having this just amazing experience, like they would call it a lightning, lightning experience. And then actually, after, when he, once he came out of that state, that's when he wanted to know how could he return to that state. And he's been looking, and he, or he started looking, and around that time he met my mother. He went back to Germany, he met my mother in Germany, and she introduced him to a meditation group. And then he, he realized that this would be a path of returning, eating uh, raw foods and meditating. No, he's not a raw foodist. <laughs> uh, he, he believes it's one of the pathways to deeper states of consciousness, eating light, fasting, uh, eating raw food. Um, but he never really became a raw foodist like we have been for like decades. But he, he knows that there's power behind the food. And from a spiritual perspective, 
the, the raw food has a lot of prana. Prana is life force energy. It's also called mana in Hawaiian, uh, ki or chi in different languages. So the, the raw food and living food is very high in prana. And the prana can help to have a different vibration, like to change your vibration and to connect more with your, your subtle body. Mm. Yeah. So do you think this is an element of like raw foods or fruitarians that they, they miss? Because I mean, most of them, yes, we eat, they eat fruit. Oh, I feel great. I feel connected to source. But they have nothing to do with meditation or yoga or, or any kind of other things like that. Yes, and a lot of people eat raw food also for health reasons. And if you do it right, it can be very healthy for you. Um, just like with any diet, from my perspective, there can be benefits and there can also be um, some things that are really terrible, detrimental to your health. And so for many spiritual seekers, raw food, they see raw food as, as a type of food that can help them connect more with their spirit, like, in other words, like with their inner higher being. Yeah. So that's your parents, that's how they met in their story. And, you know, basically, so your parents were vegetarian and your dad with raw vegan aspirations way yes. back in the day. So maybe you were even conceived when he was raw at some point or they were definitely eating all plants. Yes, they were vegetarians and they uh, still are vegetarians, pretty much vegan now. And all plants, but they had dairy. The dairy right. is part of, and so I was born into a household of vegetarians. My parents turned vegetarian a few years before I was born. And, um, but with dairy, no eggs. And it's called in, in the yogic and sattvic lang in yogic and Ayurvedic language, they call it sattvic. Sattvic food is food that's good for your body and also good for your spirit. Sattvic food. So they were on a sattvic diet. So I was raised on that kind of sattvic diet, you know, which, like I said, can help also connect with, with the spirit. Um, so I, I did eat dairy for a long time during my childhood until my te teenager years. And then I noticed I had like excess mucus. And I know I was, it was just the, I started reading and learning about it because I wanted to get rid of all the excess mucus. Do you have any acne? No. No acne, not just mucus. Ma not minor, you know, minor during my teenager years, but minor. It was really the mucus. I, I used to have one a clean tissue in one pocket and always like a used one or bunch in my other pocket. It's like constantly my nose was chronically running and I was just congested. I couldn't breathe properly. And actually that really... I wanted to improve that and I started hearing about how dairy can congest your can, can, can congest you and once I cut down on the dairy and then at some point when I was uh, 15 I cut it out altogether I just noticed I could breathe better and it's like oh my gosh you know it felt just amazing you know to be able to breathe and also I cut out bread and other things that are mucus forming at that point. So since you've been 15 you've been vegan then? Yes, that's correct. Wow. Yes. So you, so vegetarian at birth, and at 15 you became vegan. Yes. Yes. Wow, amazing. So tell us more about your later teenage years, and then how you found raw, and when you went raw. Yes, there's actually a story. Um, one school friend, who I lost touch with, he left the school I was in. We used to tease him. He was just a little bit bigger than us skinny guys and girls. He was just a little. He was not. Now, do you think you were skinny because you're vegetarian and even vegan? You didn't get enough protein. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so <laughs> because, you know, growing up in Germany, all my friends were pretty skinny and we were all like lean, uh, all of us basically. You know? even, if, or even your friends that just ate regular German food. That's right. So I cannot, standard German diet yes. <laughs> instead of standard American diet. <laughs> yes, yes. And it, it, I don't think it was the food really that kept us lean. Yeah, I mean, when you, you burn more calories when you're a kid and you could handle more, I mean, I would say abuse as a child. And we were outside, you know, on bicycles, skateboards, like yeah. active all day. And even at school during the breaks, we'd play frisbee and we were like super active. Not to be active, but we were having You're fun. You're just kids you know? having fun, yeah. yeah and just playing outside like kids used to do. <laughs> this is before before computers. Before you know? cell phones, before, before all this stuff. Exactly. And so my friend, for some reason, he was a little bit bigger. 
you know. Now he'd probably be considered normal, but he was just a little bit bigger, and we'd, we would tease him for it. I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I apologize. You should apologize to him right now if you know his name. <laughs> yes, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas. Because <laughs> we've all made mistakes when we were kids. So we teased him, and then he, he went to another school. I don't think because we teased him, he just went to another school, and then didn't see him for a few years. And then a few years later, I saw him again, and he looked really amazing. Like, he looked better than anybody else. He, and there was a vibrancy about him. He, it was just, he, it's like his whole vibration changed and his presence, you know. And he also, he, at that point, he started meditating. And it's like, How old was he at that point? Uh, 17, 18. Wow, you know? so really young. Yeah. Like, most kids in, in the U.S. would never even start meditating or go raw or anything. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was pretty young still. And his, his dad suffered from Parkinson's. Uh. And actually, so I asked him, hey, what are you doing? Why, well, you look amazing, you know? And his vibration, just his presence. And he said, you know what? Because my dad's condition, we decided to eat raw one day a week. Rokost. Yes, rokost. Oh, rokost. I don't say it right. <laughs> rokost. That's what he told you. He said rokost. Yeah. Uh, okay. One day a week, right? One day. What's just one day a week of raw vegan? Yeah. One day a week, and that it transformed him. Yes. Wow, yes. that's amazing. Yes, he had. He pro they probably made some other lifestyle changes yeah, as well. Yeah, and probably ate hopefully healthier yes. choices instead of standard German diet. <laughs> but it was, and when he explained to me, I asked him, "Well, what are you doing, and why?" And he's like, you know, the idea is, sure, it's for health also, but the idea is to eat things the way they were created by the creator in nature. You know, unprocessed, as, as fresh as possible and as the least processed um, possible. And, you know, when he said that, like, it, it kind of it clicked, you know. I'm like, oh, my gosh, yeah, this, this makes so much sense. And being out here in nature, you know, there's mango trees all yeah, over, a bunch. you know. We walked by so many They're mangoes falling. on the ground, we should have brought a bag. <laughs> and it's, it's just like eating things that they, the way they appear in nature. And, you know, I was 18 years old. It made so much sense to me. And he said also it, it connects him to just a dimension that he can't even explain, you know. He just feels a certain peace and a calm. And, and it also he did that and then he started meditating. So I believe his physical vibration changed and then he started to like also want to work with his mind uh, take it you know? to the next level yes mm -hmm. which including me i have not <laughs> <laughs> it's on the list to do <laughs> and so that that was really a big moment in my life you know a life-changing moment wow so and like you're around 17 18 yes 18 yes that's right it's like 1995 wow yeah, yeah. That's funny. Uh, I started really, in 95, too. Yeah, I know. You said <laughs> it's a good that. and so did Paul Neeson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was a real transformation. I mean, hearing from him, I didn't go raw right away. Um, but it kind of, I made like, oh, this is what I want to do. Planted a seed. Uh, it, huge, it planted a seed, definitely. And then just soon after, I'm like, I want that, too. And I wanted, I wanted to take my, I was vegan, and I know I could feel better. I know I could do better. Well, what and, kind of vegan were you? Whole food, plant-based, or just junk food processed, or uh, what? You know, this was really before. Whole food, plant-based. There before, was no such like, thing. Impossible <laughs> meat and stuff like that. So it was very, I would say, very healthy, uh, vegan, uh, with salads every day and uh, steamed vegetables, and we basically didn't get any white sugar. It was a very clean diet. We never went to any any health, uh, any um, fast food. Um, restaurants like my mother's like no way we're not going to you know I won't say any names but <laughs> any of those uh, chains so never did you know and even the school food in comparison with what I see kids eat and uh, now and especially uh, in Puerto Rico and I'm sure in many places in the world even the the food in, at school was like really healthy you know really fresh stuff. well yeah back back then and older and then probably maybe in Germany they eat healthier than America anyways <laughs> and lots of vegetarians too I was always you know surrounded by vegetarians in Germany I, I don't know the numbers I heard at some point that 20 percent of Germans were wow. or are vegetarians and I'm not sure how accurate that is um, but it, it felt that way, you know, when I was with school friends, there were always a bunch of vegetarians, so it was really great. Yeah, I felt a lot of um, support, basically, you know. Yeah. So community was important to you even when you were younger. Yes, it was not conscious, you know, I, I right. didn't like, unconscious. oh, you're vegetarian, let's be friends, or it, it was just, yeah, unconscious. And there was like a certain 
natural connection. I remember, remember another incident, actually, and this was when it, what really made me turn vegan is uh, we were sitting, I remember. When you were 15, you turned vegan. When I was 15, right. that's right. Uh, so we were sitting all at a table with a bunch of uh, at a, uh, eating pizza. And some of my friends were eating pizza with meat and uh, some of my friends were, we were eating pizza, vegetarian pizza. With just cheese. cheese and tomato, you know, they're just... Olives, whatever, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then the, the, the meat eaters, they started kind of saying that you need to have meat and all these reasons. And I had no reason. I could not tell them any reason why I was vegetarian. Wow. And I could not even, this was before I became vegan even. So I had no reason. I like I, just because your parents I were, lost, that's what you learned. I lost the argument by far. You know? I, had no, I had nothing to say, really. They're like, why are you vegetarian? You should eat meat and this and that. And I went home and, Mom, why am I vegetarian? And, oh. <laughs> and she gave me a book. Uh, and I read the book, like, within a What was the book? Do you days. remember? Uh, the, the title, in, it, I in don't, German? there's no good translation, Leichenschmaus, which is basically... Uh, the funeral at the funeral the like the meal i don't know what the ex exact last meal last meal i guess yes but it's it's like that the uh, translation would be eating dead food you know mm. i mean not totally dead not just cooked dead like dead animals you know I see. and i read the book and so i found all the reasons why veg being vegetarian is beneficial for health but then also for the planet and then they took it also they took it to veganism and they talked about all the reasons why for the planet we should be vegans and you know i, I was early teenager my health was pretty good you know yeah i mean you're so resilient when so you're younger i wasn't sick i didn't turn to veganism or raw foods because i was i was sick I, it just resonated with me you know it, uh, that's really rare for somebody so young in my opinion especially when you're a teenager you feel like super strong i mean I actually had a conversation with my nephew today who sent me a picture of what he ate for breakfast what do you think of my breakfast uncle john it was a picture of, like highly processed bacon and stuff and i'm like I, you know you I, and i didn't even tell him what i thought i'm like you know what i think about it nico he didn't need to ask me that he yeah. knows and you know i i believe now looking back at that time when we became vegans like a bunch of my friends as well it was like uh, drinking smoking was like normal you know mm. you were not a rebel when you were doing those things <laughs> you know it's just normal and we wanted to be different we wanted to really like be very different from everybody else and nobody was raw you know oh, so and, that drove you to be yeah. i mean actually that's kind of what drives me on some of those i like being not ordinary and being a little bit different you know driving a motorcycle or driving a sports car when I was younger and having the weird car, you know, had a DeLorean when I was younger mm -hmm. and like being, you know, oh, who's that guy in the DeLorean or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I, and maybe that's helped me also to, you know, stay on this path, which is something that most people never, because if you want to fit in, then this is not the diet for you. You're, yeah. I mean, it's, you're going to be, and some levels maybe even ostracized. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm like, I thrive on that. I'm like, yeah, I'm nice. glad to be different, man. Proud to be different. Be different, man. <laughs> so yeah, we were like, we were really different. We really stood out eating vegan raw food. It was just nobody, nobody that did that at that time that I knew. Exactly. Yeah, it was rare. And lots of my friends got into it, and it was like a whole movement. You know, it was like a whole group of people that started eating eating this way, and then. And we felt great, you know, we felt just so amazing. We had so much energy. And at that time, I got into wheatgrass juice. Actually. Oh, wow. So we started. How did you learn about wheatgrass juice back then in Germany when you're yeah. 18? Yeah, actually, I think I was 16. Oh, you're 16. So even before you vegan. became vegan. Yes. No, you became vegan at 15 before you came raw at 18. Yeah. Yes. So it was like I became vegan. And then actually, it, it was through a job. I mean, it's just amazing how things just came into my life you know how yeah I mean, a lot of things like that has happened to me too yeah it's, it's, I, so basically I was looking for like a job on the weekend one day a week so I can could have some extra money and buy some things that I wanted to buy and the job I got through my mom's friend uh, was growing sprouts <laughs> growing, growing bagging selling sprouts for actually they were delivered this was in the south of Germany to some of the very big companies and like Mercedes, you know. Wow. So they, the employees, I'm sure they weren't just eating sprouts, <laughs> but they were part of their, the food 
on the plate in at lunch, I suppose, were sprouts. And then my <clears throat> boss at the the sprouts place, he discovered wheatgrass juice, and then he made wheatgrass juice and started growing wheatgrass and stuff. And it's like. I tried it, of course, and then I started growing some at home and gave some to my friends. And we were skateboarding. We had all we had so much energy and it felt so amazing, you know. It's like and while well, others were drinking beer and whatnot. You're you drinking know? wheatgrass juice. <laughs> drinking. It's just it was funny at the time. It was like we want to be different. You know? not, <laughs> That's different. <laughs> not consciously, like if we want to be different, so we'll drink wheatgrass juice. But it it just it worked, you know. And people were like, oh, it's not good for you. You need to eat this and that. You're going to die and all people were like worried about us and we're like yes you know we got a, we got their attention <laughs> it's, it's a funny time it's so, a great time Kailash, i'm really wondering this so i mean obviously you've stayed right even progressed from where you started because you have continued to learn and evolve but all your friends i want to know about all your friends you still keep in touch with them are they still raw today are they raw food influencers in germany or yeah. are they just eating standard german diet now or what are they not, doing? Not standard. Uh, <laughs> I think those that were vegetarians, uh, the, are still? they are still vegetarians. Uh, and like one very close friend whom I see every time I go to Germany pretty much, uh, he's, he's still, I'd say 90 plus percent vegan. So he's okay. still... But not raw. He's not raw. No, he was raw for a shorter period I of see. time. I, I think I'm the only one who... <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep being different! <laughs> and be more different! <laughs> you know, it, it's a different friend of mine who, who's been vegan for many decades. And uh, when I ask him, is, are you still vegan? He's like, by default, you know. <laughs> and for, I, when, like, my answer, are you still raw? By default, you know, it's just <laughs> what I've been doing so long. And I'm not as strict anymore as I used to be. I was like 100% for um, probably pretty much two decades. I mean, you knew me. Yeah, you, no, you I know. Me. You would always say, you that you say to me, you're the strictest raw foodist I know. Yep, absolutely. I was so strict, I'd make no exceptions ever, you know, no. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, you have certain dietary things that you will eat and you won't eat, you know, so yeah. that's. I, was, I believe that makes it harder personally, but... <laughs> I was super strict. And then I had a son, you know, in Brazil, and who's here with me, um, well, up at the house. And once in a while he gave me... He, he started out raw, actually, for quite some time. But then he started eating some other foods. Um, vegetarian, all vegetarian. At the beginning, all vegan. And then he'd offer me something like steamed vegetables, sometimes that his mom would make, my wife would make. And I'd be like, I'm not going to say no to this, you know? He's like sweet to me. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I would have some steamed vegetables here and there. And I was, I just, it, it didn't make sense to be strict anymore to me. But how did it feel like you had one more so steamed vegetable? Did you, oh my gosh, I already feel tired. I need to go to bed from one steamed vegetable. <laughs> Absolutely not. Did you tank your energy? No. Did you break out in acne? Did no. you have to go to the hospital? I mean, what happened, man? None of those things. <laughs> um, and like, I was concerned that I'd be like, once I break the, like a dam, you know? Once oh, you're just going to eat McDonald's exactly. now and go down well, to like the... <laughs> maybe not that because... Well, I mean, you'd stay I've vegan, obviously. That. You're right. always, you're always going to stay exactly. vegan, but eat G vegan junk food. Yeah. And uh, no, it, it, I, I mean, you know, I, I can still go through months and months. I could still be 100% raw, but it's just not as important to me anymore. It used to be like my identity. Mm. You know, everybody knew me and I didn't even... I felt like embarrassed to break that, you know, and people to see me eat something else. And then I'm like, why am I doing this, you know? And then, I mean, there's a lot of raw food that's really not very good for you. And that's a lot worse than steamed vegetables, yep. for example. And I used to eat, uh, basically at the beginning, fruits and nuts, lots of fruits and nuts. And probably, I would say, a steamed uh, broccoli is healthier than eating lots of nuts and lots of fruit. Well, dried fruit and nuts. Yeah, I mean, I remember going to New York with you one time, and then we go to some restaurant just so we could have the raw food dessert. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. We didn't eat the food, we just ate the dessert. <laughs> yeah, we did, yeah, yeah, it was good. So. <laughs> but not very healthy. I know, uh, steamed vegetables healthy. are healthier than that, but we would both agree on that one. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't really cook, you know, but I mean, you've offered me some things, I don't say no anymore to those things, if they make sense, if I feel like 
they're not doing any harm to me. And if I could see a potential, that they could be good. They either, either have to be neutral or good for me. Otherwise, I'm not going to go for the cooked food. But Kailash, this is something I know that I want everybody to know also. But you know, we're here in Puerto Rico, right? Many years ago, they had a hurricane which basically flattened everything. They, I mean, it was on the news and everything and like no, no anything was coming in. They didn't have food to eat. He, the grocery stores were just empty. Couldn't get gas. Like, how did you survive and eat when like there's no food in the grocery stores? And what did you eat? And did you stay raw during that time? You know. And I, what did it teach you actually? Yes. So, a uh, full disclaimer: I was not here during the hurricane. Ah. I came right after because my family was here, mm. and I was actually in Brazil. It was between hurricanes that I could leave, and then I couldn't come back for a little while after Hurricane Maria in 2017 which, like you said, really devastated the island and it was a total power outage throughout the whole island and f food shortage and basically I heard, I wasn't here right after or during, I heard there was just nothing raw you could find or buy. You know, all so no fruits and vegetables? No fruits. Like all the, tree, all the fruits off the trees basically yeah. like blown away, well, vegetables got down. ripped up. The trees, you know, the, the, even the, the, most of the trees were down. It's just when we got back, when I got back, it was like you, 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 from a lot of places where you could never see the ocean, all of a sudden you could see, could mm. see the ocean. It's just the vegetation, lots of the vegetation came down, lots of fruit trees and so forth and so on. And also, that's why we're planting some root vegetables now, you know, because <laughs> if, like, the Japanese... Well, the, for me, it's not emergency food, it's just food, <laughs> but yeah. So here, it's, it's good to have some root vegetables in case of a hurricane, which could happen any... Any, any time. Any, any year, any... There's a season, well, certain, yeah, you know, certain, certain months. time of the year. So I, when I got back, um, actually, there were some plantains I could eat, so you um, let them ripen up fully and ate them exactly, raw? Exactly, yes. Uh huh. And what we did, also we didn't have power or water for three months. Uh, so How do you get, stay hydrated? We couldn't even wash our hands. We got water. So they were giving out water, you know, um, so we, we could get free, free water. But what we do once a day, we went to uh, Sizzler's. Sizzler, yeah, yeah it's Sizzler. a big steakhouse. Big steakhouse. Yeah, big chain. I did not eat steak. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but they have a big salad bar, all you could eat, right, right, for one low price. And so they got, they had food, they got food imported, and it was like, they didn't, they didn't have much water But either. the grocery store didn't have any food. No. The but Sizzler had food. Didn't. They got food, and so I would go, we would go there once a day, we'd pay uh, like a fixed price, and all you could eat. So we'd be there and eat once a day. And hey, that's good. You're like intermittent fasting like the best. <laughs> One meal a day. <laughs> and I, I did eat some things that I usually don't, mm. that are not that healthy. Um, I mean, I stayed vegan, but there was, there were like, you know, some potatoes, stuff that... So are, baked potatoes, probably. Yeah. Not, not heat processed the best way, just in an oven and brown and... Yeah. So I had some Not organic. Stuff. <laughs> did I get addicted to it? No, I, I didn't. Oh, did you eat it with like salt and ketchup or no, no, butter no, or anything? No, no. You ate them plain. Yeah, plain. And they had lettuce and different vegetables. Yeah, salad, basic salad stuff. It was really big salad, but then... What they, dressing did you use? Anything? Nothing? They didn't have... No, nothing. I'm not... Usually don't... Do, I do avocado, you know, and sometimes they had avocados, but not always. But I was hungry, so I was doing <laughs> you some... Eat what you can get to stay alive, yes, like literally. Exactly. This was I mean, know, survival. Like guess. survival after the yeah. hurricane. Yeah, yeah. So that was a tough time, you know. And what did you learn from that, Kailash? Did you learn that, like, you're addicted to potatoes, and if you eat one no. potato, you're going to go and eat vegan junk food now, or what? No, definitely not. Definitely <laughs> did you not. get more tired? Did you have energy? I mean, uh, did you break out? I mean... No. None of that. I mean, I ate pretty clean. It was still 90% of my plate Whole food. Were, were like, was raw and vegetables, romaine lettuce and uh, carrots and beets and shredded, you know, all those kind of things. And then some, some potatoes maybe in addition to that. <laughs> but actually, I've not been back since. So that was maybe for a few months that we went there every day until we could find food in the supermarket. And the smell, I've, the smell is so gross. So I I'm haven't inside Sizzler. I cannot because well, yeah, it's all the I meat have smell. Not the gone back. Charred meat. At the time, it was like a matter of survival. We needed to eat something, 
but this like at some point you know toward the end of those two months and i'm like i don't want to go there anymore because the smell like i was so grossed out of the, the smell in the uh, i feel system. you man i mean i go to some asian markets and it's just like i mean i got to get my produce but man it's not the best smell yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's so we learned about you know you going off raw so like to this date kailash how much raw would you say you eat because you know you experimented with heat processed food or cooked food you didn't get addicted to it. One more also didn't make you go crazy. Oh. You didn't go like like that, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So how do you how do you eat today? Like, what's your standard diet, and do you still eat cooked food these days? Um, very rarely. I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm, I don't identify with like I don't have to be hundred percent raw anymore, which was like my religion. You know, it's like it was so important to me. It was my identity. And now occasionally, I mean, I, you know I have the Instant Pot. Yeah, I think you'd never use it because when, when I'm using it, it looks like brand new. <laughs> so that tells you. <laughs> you don't even use it. But you do have a full stove and your wife does cook for yeah. your child and herself. Yeah, sometimes she makes like broccoli and I'd have some broccoli or cauliflower once in a while, things like that. And, I mean, what I eat mostly, I love smoothies and uh, you know how much I love blending stuff and making green smoothies and that's pretty much every day I have a smoothie in the morning I may have like I may make it today for, and then for two days so I may have one um, quart in the morning and then in the afternoon and then lunch and dinner usually salads or I also love doing blended soups they're so easy to take or with blended me. salads blended salads and then I might I eat some fruits often like usually in the afternoon I love mangoes I mean we're in the tropics in Puerto Rico they're, in they're, season they're right falling now. off the trees <laughs> <laughs> can't eat them all <laughs> I love mangoes and papayas and I like fruits in general so I'll have some fruit usually in the afternoon like it's my afternoon fun sit down take a break from everything mangoes i love mangoes yeah jackfruit <laughs> yeah so you have basically one fruit meal a day and otherwise you have like a big smoothie or you know for breakfast and then maybe like a salad or blended salad or blended soup for 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 dinner yes roughly yes yes roughly. so kind of in general four meals a day oh four so it's the smoothie in the morning and then it's either a salad or a blended salad for lunch mm. And then either fruit meal in the afternoon, or if I'm if I'm busy and driving around or teaching yoga sessions, and then sometimes I don't have time to sit down for a fruit fruit meal, so I would have more of the smoothie in the afternoon, and then again for dinner, either a blended salad or an actual salad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. So I think that's a very important point. I want to stop at and really talk to you guys about because I mean when Kailash and I were younger we had like maybe two fruit meals a day or maybe even sometimes more mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people out there may promote high fruit diets and yes when you're younger my opinion maybe Kailash's you could handle fruit more and as you get more mature in your years you know I think we've, we've both naturally gravitated to eating more vegetables. I mean, I had to be knocked over the head with blood tests and see my microbiome test. And, Me too, yeah. And finally, mm -hmm. like, oh man, you gotta really eat more vegetables. I mean, that's why I choose to heat process in the best ways possible my vegetables these days. I mean, Kailash, I mean, still is maintaining the raw, um, with, with, you know, things where his kid feeds him something or on a rare occasion, you know, but he or doesn't. Or my wife sometimes. Or his wife, yes. yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that, Kailash, as you get more mature, you maybe gravitate towards more vegetables and do you think that maybe when we were younger we should have gravitated to more vegetables back then which I, I would say I I believe at this point looking back on it I should have gravitated to eating more vegetables back then because I think I would be healthier and better off mm -hmm. yes I was from my perspective eating too much fruit at the beginning and as I mentioned earlier also just cashew nuts fruits cashew nuts so there weren't a lot of vegetables um, but then then I kind of realized something was missing and then I, I started to which really I was raised on not only salads but eating a salad every day at least once a day and then I, I missed that so I started making salads again at some point and it just felt right you mm. know I felt better it, I felt more balanced and just my whole body seemed to function better once I started eating more vegetables and 
And now I, I actually I like vegetables a lot. You know? <laughs> no, they're good. They can be yeah. amazing. I've really, I mean, when I was a kid, it's like very young kid. It, it was a little hard. My parents had to get me, like almost force me to eat the salads. But then I started to like the salads, and I also really have come to love those blended salads. Mm. I, I just really love those blended salads. So it's just having a smoothie, having a blended salad, are um, create a good balance I find in my body, my system, and and I like them equally. You know, I like the blended salad just as much as a sweet smoothie. Which and actually, my smoothies are always green, <laughs> unless I put a lot of like. Uh, something that would turn them red, like the the red dragon, dragon fruit, fruit. Sometimes, like even putting lots and lots of greens with that in the smoothie, they turn the smoothie turns a little red. But I always put a lot of a lot of uh, greens, lots of greens into my smoothies, so they're really very green. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Kailash. So we definitely have learned about being vegetarian since birth, vegan since you're 15 and being raw vegan since you're about 18. Mm -hmm. And so that's like your diet, but you know, here's the thing guys and girls, Kailash is a lot more than just the diet and the raw foods actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, the raw foods is actually just what fuels them really. Mm -hmm. He's a lot more about the spiritual. So you want to go into that because you mentioned that your parents were into that, mm -hmm. but how did they kind of put the, I don't want to say put this lifestyle on you, but how did you learn this lifestyle from them and then take it even further and you've gone through yoga teacher trainings and different Feldenkrais. Uh, trainings and, and other kind of modalities that actually to help people. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the beginning, like I said earlier, I was rebelling I'd, and there was a short period of time where I didn't eat very well before I became vegan and raw and I, I, I just wanted to be different from my parents too, mm. you know. And fortunately I did find veganism and also raw foods and a little bit like what I shared with you earlier, like my friend who changed his diet, he kind of was looking for something to match that vibration and he found meditation. And so something very when you're 18. similar happened to me as well. Wow. I first became raw and then I started meditating regularly. I mean, I've, of course, I saw my parents meditate and they do yoga postures as well the so-called asanas but the main thing was really meditation twice a day and then maybe my mom sometimes would do some yoga postures my dad pretty religiously every day every morning usually do some postures but it was really um, their yoga is meditation you know and that's really that's a side note the heart of yoga is meditation and the postures they were developed by the yogis to help us sit more comfortably and also purify the subtle channels of the body so the so it's easier to have a clear and calm and peaceful mind mm -hmm. and so for me once i started eating all raw i felt like i i really wanted to meditate and mm -hmm. i remembered my parents meditating and i'm like let me give this a try you know and then kind of remembering and seeing my parents all the time meditating and practicing yoga, some yoga postures. It's like, all right, let, let's, let's see how this feels, you know, if this is my path as well. And it just, it, it just really resonated deeply with me. So I was kind of at that point over being rebellious <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of embraced the practices that my parents were doing and, and really they became I mean, they've been always, always been my teachers from day one, obviously, and influences. And it was in the later, in my later teenager year, starting like it was around 18 when I started going raw. And the same year I started meditating. Wow. And then it, it kind of like, I felt that like a strong connection and like lots of gratitude too, to having these parents who I'm, I've been raised by, you know. Yeah, raised you a lot differently than most kids, yeah. <laughs> I'd say. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so have you been meditating ever since you're 18, like nonstop, and then even gone kind of further and gone through additional trainings and, and learnings over and beyond, you know, what your, of course, parents have taught you? Yeah, so first when I learned meditation and some yoga postures, some asanas, it was really for myself. And then for my body, for my spirit, for my health, and then I got interested in teaching others. Why? Why did you want to start teaching? It felt like a calling, really. You know, it's like I, I had a, 
have a friend in, in Germany also that was still in Germany at the time and he was able to teach a few yoga, yoga postures that I was practicing already but I never taught any postures and then I saw him and I just loved it and somebody I looked up to and I'm like oh you know this is cool you can teach people yoga postures and I want to be able to do that you know and then and then I really got into like wow I want to do a teacher's training and then actually I moved to Maui where I lived for a year and I studied yoga there for one year and then I moved to California and I just I wanted to deepen my studies so I did another teacher's training and then there was a teacher. And that's when we met. That's where so we met. So 24 years exactly. ago, you yeah. went through well, t yoga teacher training. Yes. Well, yes. The first one was in 1999 when I lived on Maui. So 25 years ago. And then actually I moved to Puerto Rico first where I studied living foods. And then I moved to California. And that's where I deepened my studies in yoga. And so I took another a second teacher's training. And then there was a teacher trainings going on in Santa Rosa, where I was living in Yun Runa Park, right, at the time. And so there was another training going on, and they were looking for a yoga teacher. And I wasn't a yoga teacher yet, but I had done two trainings and many years of experience. And then they hired me right away. Oh, wow. And I just loved teaching people the postures. And I wasn't teaching meditation at that time it was really mostly the postures that I was teaching and then I in Santa Rosa actually did my first yoga therapy training and a few others afterward and then some years later I started teaching at Kripalu in Massachusetts at probably the biggest yoga facility in the West I started they hired me to teach yoga therapy so it's like first year yoga teacher and then if you want to take it to another level, you become a yoga therapist. So I'm a trainer of yoga therapy, yoga therapists, which I love doing. And it's like a great honor to so be for, part of So for that. those of us that aren't in that world, Kailash, I mean, what is a yoga therapist? Because I, mm -hmm. I don't even know. So a yoga therapist, basically, when you become a yoga teacher, you learn the postures, you learn how to practice them, you learn how to teach them. You learn some basic benefits of the postures. You might learn a sequence. And you, if it's a more advanced yoga teacher's training, you might learn how to actually create sequences as well. And so it's more general. So you're, you're learning about yoga. You're learning the yoga postures. And then in yoga therapy, you're learning how to use postures and also breathing techniques, meditation, mudras, which are hand gestures. and other things to help people with specific conditions people mm. who suffer from specific conditions like uh, back pain you know lots of people have come to me to get help with their back pain and then i create a sequence a custom tailored a calibrated sequence to their needs to the time that they have available which then they practice at home and usually I record it on their phone so they can they don't, they don't have to remember it or look at drawings or with video even. Or somebody who suffers from anxiety, I might teach them a few gentle postures, movements, and then also give them a hand gesture, mudra, and or a breathing practice to reduce their anxiety. Mm. So yoga therapy is it, it's not just like physical therapy who works focuses on the body. Yoga therapy is beyond just the body. It also works with um, actually cancer and diabetes and heart disease. Wow. Dean Ornish, he published uh, this On yoga study. therapy? Um, not yoga therapy, but using yoga to help people reverse um, heart disease with vegetarian food uh, as well. Plant-based diet, yeah. So it, it works with all kinds of conditions. But again, the, the, so it's holistic. It's a holistic approach mm. to health. It looks at the whole human being. And, um, but the ultimate intention Really, the ultimate goal of yoga is really to connect us to, to that unshakable peace that's within us, you know. But, and it's really difficult to feel that when we're in pain, when we're anxious, when we're depressed, when we don't feel good, you know, when we feel we don't, we're not enough and so forth. And yoga is really, um, originally, yoga is about 
reconnecting because we all have it inside of us you know it's already there and it's reconnecting us with this which Eckhart Tolle the, the author of Power of Now he calls it deep unshakable peace and the radiant joy of being mm -hmm. just being present and just being here in the moment and feeling that this is all perfect as it is you know, despite all the shortcomings and despite everything that has happened and things that we anticipate that will happen but it's a sense of this is enough this is I'm perfect everything is perfect as it is which doesn't mean and this is often misunderstood it's like oh yoga you now you go into your room and you're always at peace and you know it's a struggle you know <laughs> it's not easy to get to that place but it's like a muscle you can train you train that muscle and you keep returning to that to that peace and I love how uh, this image of the ocean and it's always calm deep down mm. and it can be like so crazy and all the waves and the storm at the surface yeah but then deep down you know and it's to, to be able to remember that deep down we have this calmness this this peace and this this just this pure joy mm. you know so yoga is really about reconnecting learning how to reconnect with that which we have with us all the time we're born with it so you just need to know how to channel and reconnect with it yes. and that's what you teach yes and i believe also the food is a big part of that too. yeah so how does how do these two connect from the yoga and the food and how do they work like together right yes they they work very well together and uh gabriel cousins i've read his books and also met him and saw him a few times uh, throughout the years and it, it's he talks a lot about how to connect the two the the body and the spirit and through conscious conscious eating and through natural foods you know it's like coming back to what my friend said who inspired me is like the more naturally the more natural the food is that we eat the more it connects us with nature like the outer nature but also with this inner nature with our true nature you know there's all that processed food and and all that noise you know all the in the world is is like almost everything is there and the marketing to distract us you know you need this to be happy you need that to be happy you just need to be a little bit stronger or a little bit thinner or a little bit this or that and it's like buy this buy that and and so this the teachings the true deeper teachings of of yoga are really you know, in Feldenkrais too, which you mentioned earlier, which I'm a practitioner of, is really connecting with that radiant joy of being. So I got a question for you, Kailash. So, I mean, does cooked food disconnect you with that radiant source of being, whereas raw food would support that? Or what would you say? Because I know on a, on a physical level, you'll say, yeah, some heat processed foods could have some health benefits. But like on the more spiritual level, how does it affect you? Because, I mean, you're, you're the expert in this. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so... Um, actually, and I would partially disagree, in Ayurveda, you may have heard... I know, no, yes. I know it, and they say raw, too much raw is not good. And, and so I, I, I have studied Ayurveda, and I basically believe in a lot of the Ayurvedic principles. principles. I think they're really wonderful. And the truth is, Ayurveda comes from India. Yep. I've been to India, and I got sick because I was eating raw food there and you can't do <laughs> raw when you have no good sanitation <laughs> and so in, in India and things are starting to change and also depends a little bit on where you are in India um, but basically um, the food there most of the food is cooked to kill bacteria and to like uh, bugs and whatnot you know worms and so it's it's a system that came out of India and I believe we need to adapt it to to the west to our needs where we we don't have to be concerned about eating raw food and so in Ayurveda I mean they they promote cooked food for spiritual elevation but also raw food for whom it is right and depending on where in India you are mm. you know it varies a little bit but they would definitely the, the yogis would say the majority of your food the majority of your food should be raw I see the majority um, but they, I'm, I haven't heard anywhere it's like it has to be all raw food you know so a small percentage from the yogis that I that I know um, they all eat some almost all of them eat some cooked food 
Yeah, because like I mean, highest I would, quality, really good of course, quality, really and high. Minimally quality. processed because it's like more natu natural. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, over in India, they have some of the most spiritual people, or, or said, I mean, you've been there, I haven't. And so, but you know, a lot of those, I mean, they're not raw foodists, right? So, no. what percentage when you've gone over there, and I mean, I'm sure you have friends that are more raw than not, but in general, when you would see a yogi over there, or visit an ashram or whatever it is, I don't know what they are. <laughs> What percentage are they just serving raw in, in in their ashram or whatever they're called? It varies a little bit, uh, bit if, whether you're the north of India I or see. the south of India. India is such a big country, and in the south it's tropical, so you have uh, a lot more availability. Or tropical fruit and stuff. And in the north, it, I mean, the Himalayas in the oh, yeah, region, it's cold very, and... very cold. So it really varies. And if you look at Tibet, I mean, the Buddhists in Tibet they eat basically all cooked food. There's hardly any raw food. But around. they're very spiritual still. Yes, yes, yes. So it doesn't necessarily hinder spiritual... Not necessarily, no. I would, I would say, and this is in, in agreement with uh, many of my teachers, what they would say, it's ideal to be on a vegetarian diet and also to eat lots, large quantities of raw food. But they're not specific about 80% or 90% or this or that. But what, whatever it is, it should be... Um, vegetarian and also the least processed so if it's heat processed it should be processed in the best uh, ways possible wonderful all right so we learned about the raw foods the yogic side of you which is more yoga therapy which is beyond just a yoga teacher which is what many people just do the postures um, but let's learn about the Feldenkrais so you also spoke about Feldenkrais I mean when I heard about it I was like what the heck is that man and so I'm sure almost all my viewers don't know what that is either because it's not something that's really taught or practiced widely, unfortunately. Yes. And it's, and why did you start to learn about and be able to teach and practice that now as a practitioner? Yes. So I had already studied. I completed my first yoga teacher's training. And then I heard about Feldenkrais. And the name of the movement lessons, the group classes, is Awareness Through Movement. And in fact, I was at a Feldenkrais trainer's house and a friend, he was house sitting and I picked up a Feldenkrais book in the house. I didn't know much about it, just some basics, but not much. And I opened the book. It was in German, actually. I was surprised. Oh, Whoa, wow. Why would he have a book in German? You know, Because we're in America, America and it's English. Yes, it was on Maori. So I opened the book and I thought it was some kind of body work. And then I realized Feldenkrais is really a method that can help you reach your full potential and it's a method that really works with your brain and it helps you to be more present and to be more in the moment and uh, to break movement patterns that are dysfunctional mm. and it helps with posture it helps uh, sleep better there's just it's a very it's a big method there's thousands of different movement lessons like group classes and they're called awareness through movement. So the intention, I would say, it's just like in yoga. The intention is the same to become more aware, you know, to become more present, to cultivate awareness and attention to the movements and in yoga through the postures. And in yoga, there's also movements, of course. So the awareness through movement, and it's not just awareness of movement or body awareness. It's like using the movements as a vehicle for enhancing our natural abilities to learn, to change, and to grow. And then there's another component which is hands-on where the client or student lies on a low padded table like a massage or chiropractic table and the practitioner guides the client through the movements through the use of his hands. It feels really lovely. If, uh, I should probably do it one time. <laughs> yes, yes, we should. We've never done that Maybe we before. should film it. <laughs> no, it feels, really, it feels really nice for the body. It's very gentle. Uh, it's not lymphatic massage. because The focus is not the lymph, although it, it does flow better through the movements. But it's, it's, a, it's a gentle touch. And it's, it's not as strong as Thai massage or Thai yoga. It's, it's much more gentle. It's very calming, relaxing. But the main intention is to break dysfunctional movement patterns and ways of sitting or holding, and which, are, which often result, if they haven't resulted already, in pain, mm. pain and discomfort. Yeah, so it's both preventative and also it, it's very, very good for reducing tension and pain. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I did a practice yesterday, and I would say it also creates uh, brain plasticity mm -hmm. and creates new neural connections to your brain. That's right. Because that was kind of some of the things you got to do is like totally conflicting, and your brain's thinking, wait, I can't. Yeah. I got to do this and that and this and this. And, and you have to be so present. You have to be present or it's not yes. happening. So if, I mean, you, if you're not focused, it's, if, you can't do the things. You can't do the things. I love that about Feldenkrais. <laughs> There's thousands of different lessons, and I see often people practicing yoga. We were talking earlier about a yoga tradition and where every single class is exactly the, the same. same. Every class is the same and the mind just tends to go off, you know, and it's just the it's same just the and same. Same exact brain. poses, whatever, you're just doing them in a row and it's, yeah. and I don't know, I, I would say, I mean, yeah, good, but not as purposeful. And so at Feldenkrais, like what we did yesterday, it really like, Moving Custom your eyes one way, your the, head yeah. the other way, and then you move your knees, and it's like moving your body and parts. Your arms. And, the, and then yeah. being aware of your breath, so it really requires your full focus, you know, your full attention. And it's really a way of bringing your mind fully into the moment mm. and being like really kind of still inside of yourself, you know. And it, what happens is the, the chatter, it when we're fully focused on something. You can't think about anything else because you, you have to be focused on this or it's not happening. <laughs> exactly. You lose it, you know? Yep. Your body parts start doing things that you're not telling them to do. So, you, yes, it's really, I love Feldenkrais. I love that it's, it brings you so much into the moment and it enhanced my yoga practice. Mm. I started practicing with a lot more awareness and it also my meditation. I started going a lot deeper. And because it breaks physical patterns and habits, I noticed I also started breaking some emotional wow. habits and also some thought habits, you know, certain things I wasn't even aware of. Because you become so aware all of, all of a sudden, mm. not just of your body. So mindfulness. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Wow, Kyle. So you've learned all these things, but... The other thing people don't know is that, you know, you had a job at the Ann Wigmore Institute for many years where you actually were able to practice all these modalities with people that would come to Ann Wigmore. And, you know, of course, recently you left Ann Wigmore. And now you're doing your own thing and you're able to help and teach people all over the world online. Um, so but first, I want to know why do you decide to teach people the yoga therapy, the Feldenkrais, all the things you've learned about eating healthfully, sprouting, eating living foods, raw foods, and all this. Like, why, what motivates you to want to teach people and make a difference in the world like, 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 you know, for me? I mean, honestly, for me, it is, it just makes me so happy mm. if somebody comes in and let's say they have neck pain and then I guide them through, through, through some movements, be it through my hands or verbally in a group class, and to see them get up and say like, wow, my pain is gone. And I, it just, I just love helping people in that. And with the food as well. I, yeah, you didn't even have to take an aspirin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no aspirin needed, no, man. No, no. That's amazing. The body heals itself, yeah. right? <laughs> and with the food too, and in conjunction with mm. the movements, all the anti-inflammatory anti food like the turmeric and the ginger and so on and so forth so just seeing how people like their inflammation going down they say you know i've had pain in my joints all over my body and now i feel so much better i feel better than i have felt in decades and it's just it makes me happy to mm. see people feel good and feel happy and it often really what starts happening happening also is it's once we start feeling better physically, it's like emotionally, mentally, often also doors start opening and, and it's like we start developing or maybe seeing what our true purpose is mm. as we get rid of Unclogged. The, the toxins. And I'm not just talking about physical toxins, but the really mental toxins, the mental which and is emotional probably worse. toxins. Yes. But first we have to become aware of them and that's... Uh, that's where Feldenkrais and also the conscious mindful yoga is very helpful in becoming aware of the toxins, mm. you know, the toxic mind, wow. <laughs> the thoughts. And it's, it's really a gentle process. It's not like, you now get rid of all your toxic thoughts and fight them. And it's, it's like, first we have to become aware of them, you know. We often, we're not even aware of them. And then what, a practice that I do is when those thoughts come in, I, 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 come to like an affirmation or repeat a mantra and also tell myself my guards you know guards 
come up and don't let them come don't let them um, come all the way in where they are it's okay I can see them I keep 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 them out keep them where they yeah, the are distance yeah and then focusing on something again that's really in the moment that's present like the breath the body a mantra or an affirmation those are help, helpful ways to uh, reconnecting you know I think you know for me I just see these all as tools which you know Kailash has a lot of tools in his spiritual toolbox to help you get more connected, lose the toxins out of the brain. Of course, other tools could be diet, which is one tool. And so, Kailash, how can people access you and have some of your tools? I mean, I know you just started the Vital Influence Portal, and of course, people could also sign up for sessions with you to do personal coaching sessions. So at present time, a personal session with Kailash is 120 bucks. And I know a lot of you guys may not have that money, but Kailash is starting a vital influence portal now where you could pay a monthly fee much lower than $120 and have two class sessions where he will give you personalized attention because he's going to reach out to the group and see what everybody in the group is feeling and what they're dealing with and then he's going to custom tailor the somatics practice to the group and to help each person in the group so you want to tell everybody more about your portal and your membership program that is now available for you guys to take advantage of Kailash's skills to take your life besides the raw foods to the next level. Yes, so in the portal we'll be offering two live sessions a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So one hour sessions followed by Q&A for another half hour and then there's also a whole program that I filmed, a yoga therapy program for different uh, physical conditions so neck pain shoulder pain upper back lower back hips sacrum sciatica knees and also digestive system so all of those things are already uploaded in the portal and then also I'll keep adding content to the portal and the, the content um, I already have a lot of content that I know I'll be uploading and there's also we want to hear from those that are joining the membership what they would like to see in the portal and then I'll, we'll, that information, the feedback will help mold and shape mm. the portal and you'll be on there too. Yep, <laughs> I'll be on there too. So Kailash, what is a session like and what kind of results have you heard as testimonials when you, somebody has gone through a, a group session with you before? Mm. Like what is it, what is it exactly? Because I mean we could talk about it all day but like I mean I experienced a mini session today actually and I, I heard it but people that are watching this don't even know. Yes, so in general after at the end of a session or even during you just feel calmer, you feel like more connected with yourself, feelings of deep relaxation and peace and then also physical things just if there's pain the pain tends to go down I say tend to because I don't want to promise anything and also depends on what it is if it's uh, certain conditions uh, they need maybe other help but in general um, the pain level goes down and also just feeling like more peaceful inside of the body and then throughout the day just feeling calmer and feeling more connected with the body so I've said I've, I've taught classes and at times people at the end got up they had back pain literally for decades and they say like I don't know what just happened they're like this was magic I don't have my back pain is gone wow. you know? and then for, for the majority of people after a few sessions they already feel improvement they feel like their joints have been lubricated and the joints move, work better and, and headaches less headaches or no headaches anymore just in general is a well-being a state of well-being and also then after the practice throughout the day it's just people have reported that they're less reactive mm, and so, so more it, calm yes more it calm. balances your exactly yeah. and just also feeling more connected with others and um, not just other humans but in general just feeling more connected with everything you know and including oneself I wish Kailash could offer free lessons to everybody in the world because man everybody on the freeway these days is just beeping at you they're in a rush and they just feel more connected man <laughs>
<laughs> but luckily you guys are watching this so you guys can take advantage of the special deal that we're going to offer. So Kailash, what are you going to offer everybody that's stayed to the end of this? Yes, I'd like to offer a specific breathing practice, which I've learned many years ago. And it synchronizes the brain, the heart, and the lungs. It's relatively simple, relatively short, and there's some research behind this. So that's something, a video I'm going to be offering if you click on the link below. If you share your email, we'll send that to you. Wonderful, Kailash. Yeah, I'm so grateful for you helping out my community so that they could feel more connected with the breath work you've learned how many years ago? The breath work, I started studying breath about 25, 26 years wow. ago. And then do you, yes. how often do you do this practice and what do you feel after you do it? I do this practice every morning. Every morning. This is how important it is to your health. And every evening. Wow, twice a day. Twice a day, every day, yes. And it, it feels wonderful. It just, it sets the tone for the day. I just feel calmer as I go into the day. And like you were talking about being in traffic and, <laughs> and in this world. And it just, I notice that that calm, that it's, I can be in the car and I don't get irritated by other drivers or being stuck in traffic. I don't want to say it's only the breathing practice, but it's, it's part of, it's a tool. And then in the evening, it helps me fall asleep much mm. better. So I do the breathing practice as part of a meditation also every evening. And I just, when I don't do it, that is, I will still do it, but sometimes I do it earlier in the day. And then if I don't do it again before going to bed, I notice it takes me longer to fall asleep. Wow, so what do you say, Kailash, to people that only eat raw food and think, I'm eating raw, I don't need none of that spiritual junk, man, it's hogwash. What would you, what would you tell them? Well, I, I would say we, are, we have a body, we have a physical body, and it's important, very important also from a yogic perspective to take very good care of this body. Mm. And this is, this is more the modern yogic perspective. I'm still talking thousands of years, but yoga has been around for at least 7,000 years. So back then, the body was seen as an obstacle, something to overcome. And it was often even um, misused and abused and whatnot. And so the, the more modern yogi, you know, sees the body as a temple. And from a yogic perspective, we are spiritual beings having a human experience mm. and not human beings having a spiritual experience you know? so we are we're spirit and this body like i love also how george harrison the beatles uh, lead guitar player how he puts it you know this is like a shell and it's important that we take very good care of it uh, because our spirit lives in it but at some point we leave this body you know we go somewhere else, that's a whole nother discussion, way beyond <laughs> <laughs> this. Um, but from, from, from my perspective, the yogic perspective, uh, there's, the spirit continues, you know, it, it, it's, it's somewhere. It, and, but we leave this behind, yes? So it's important while we're here to take very good care of this body through diet, through exercise, getting enough sleep, and so forth and so on. Um, and then also doing the practices that help us um, develop this connection with the with our bigger self, with our greater self, mm. whatever you want to call it, the source, the universe, or God even, you know. Wow, cool. So once again, if you guys want to get the free breathing practice to get more connected, make sure you click the link down below and enter your email address and Kailash will get that right out to you. So Kailash, any words of wisdom you'd like to share with my viewers today after they learn more about Kailash Neal's vegetarian since birth, vegan since he's been 15, and raw vegan since 18? Mm. Well, we, we talk about the breath, and I want to say, like, even you listening right now, watching this, maybe you're not even watching, it playing in the background. I mean, one thing that we can do at any moment is become more present mm. and more aware of the breath. And that itself, there's a shift, like an inner shift, and we just tend to worry less. And actually, we become more talking about the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. We, we actually enhance 
the digestive system, we're moving more into the rest and digest division of the autonomic nervous mm. system, which is the opposite from, from fight or flight. Mm. So I encourage you to become more aware of your breathing as you go through your day, maybe set reminders, uh, or at least in the morning when you wake up, feel your breath, and then in the evening before falling asleep, those are great opportunities. Also before you start driving or leave the house or before you eat, that's a, another tip. You sit down and perhaps before you dig in and before you eat, drink or whatever, is just take a moment, even if it's just three breaths, and it, there's a, it makes a really big difference in the human nervous system. You'll digest the food and maybe you'll enjoy the whole meal much more as well. <laughs> yeah, oxygen is so important to life. So good job, Kyle Ash. Thank you so much for being on my show today. And if you guys out there on YouTube land loved it, hey, please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. More importantly, share this with other people that can benefit from the content we share today. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss my new upcoming episodes of Command every five to seven days. You remember to watch or up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. Make sure you click the little bell so you get notified as my new videos come out. I have more videos coming out with Kyle Ash, who we all love also be sure to check my past episodes past episodes are wealth and knowledge over 800 episodes at this time on this channel dedicated to teaching guys about how to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables and other plant foods and live the healthiest lifestyle ever also once again links down below to some of the videos i made in the past with kailash uh, where he shares his expert knowledge about living a healthy lifestyle so with that my name is john kohler with okraw.com we'll see you next time and until then remember Keeping your fresh fruits and vegetables, they're always the best. Thank you.